Good morning, sisters and brothers. It is good to be in God's house. It is good to be with you. Uh, it's a good morning for you to show up. I believe we'll cover the bread and butter of Methodism this morning. And I'm going to do my very best. I am Chris Bryant, senior pastor here. I do want to welcome you. It's good to see each and every one of you in person. And again, those of you joining online here in this moment or maybe later in the week, it's good to have you with us. We're looking at the core of what it means to be Methodist today. What was the core of the Methodist revival movement? And ultimately, what Methodism's contribution to the whole of Christianity essentially was. No pressure, I've had two weeks. <laughs> today, I want to tell you about John Wesley's own conversion experience, if that's what you want to call it. It's a heartwarming story. <laughs> Front row got that joke, that's okay. You'll get it later on if you don't already. It's all right. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about that. And a few other historical aspects in sharing with you the theology of today. It's a challenge to try to work so much in and try to explain to some degree what was controversial and new at the time of Wesley and why it matters, and really more importantly, trying to help you see why it's important today. All the while honoring Wesley's own insistence that what he taught and preached, despite his having to explain it over and over again, was in fact nothing more than, quote, easy to be understood, plain and simple, genuine religion of Jesus Christ, end quote. John Wesley wrote, our main doctrines are repentance, faith, and holiness. The first of these we account as if it were the porch of religion, the next the door, third religion itself. This is called the house of grace. And it is the metaphor by which we might explain our understanding of salvation by grace through faith. Again, that is our text this morning, one that John Wesley preached many, many times. Dare I say it was his favorite passage, at least with regard to preaching. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is by grace and through faith. It is not our own doing. It is a gift of God. It is not the result of works, so no one may boast. But we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life or so that we may walk in them. The house of grace is obviously a metaphor that Wesley himself used. You can see it there in the quote uh, before you. Uh, the, meta the metaphor of the house of grace is a way of interpreting both the action of God and the human response to God's activity that puts all the emphasis upon God while acknowledging the importance of human cooperation. Now, that may not seem like a big deal, but in Wesley's time and to some extent still to today, what is happening here is a kind of merger, a synergy, a putting together of aspects of theology that are often talked about in opposite terms. Namely, God's activity on the one hand, and it's all about God and all of God's idea and all of God's doing. And on the other hand, our own personal experience and what our role is as humanity. Wesley used the house of grace image to help people imagine the theological truth of salvation while relating to their own personal experience. It is God that has invited us to live with him in this house of grace. God has made the house. God has invited us in. God has done it all. But will we go? Will we enter? Will we live in it? The porch of the house of grace is called prevenient grace. This is the grace that goes before grace. It is the grace that leads to grace. It is, the, it is God's activity in your life before you are conscious of it or before you even might want of it, want to do anything with it. Prevenient grace is why Methodists have no problems baptizing babies, if you are ever unsure about that. For we believe all are children of God, and we know that not any of us, none of us ever come to God, except that God, even before we are born, is already acting upon our, beh our behalf with his loving presence, calling us, wooing us to himself. This grace pervades all of creation and is universally present. It is not like a gift in the, in the sense of God packaging up something and, and bestowing it upon us. It is God's presence itself 
God himself creating, healing, forgiving, reconciling, and transforming individual human hearts and even whole communities. Wherever God is, there is grace. Some faith traditions seemingly relegate grace to only or primarily those moments of decision when a person becomes a Christian. We Methodists say, no, no, no. If but grace is what only described in those terms, you are quite late to the party. The grace of God has been yet working on you from the very beginning. The door of the house of grace is justifying grace. It is the grace of pardon and forgiveness. It is the grace of new birth, the initial freedom from the guilt and power of sin that comes through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here and here a couple of qualifications are needed. Some faith traditions make the experience of this grace synonymous with salvation. Indeed, Wesley would agree that this kind and form of grace, justifying grace, is in fact saving grace. However, salvation itself must always be a bigger picture, for the day we accept or experience justifying grace is merely the moment we realize God's grace has always been there, rather than it being the first time that grace has shown up. Furthermore, this experience of justifying grace leads to to more experiences of God's grace. It is, in fact, a door, you see, something through which we go through that leads to something else. Its purpose is not itself, but the rest of the house, all the rest of God's grace that God has for us. In Wesley's own words, justifying grace is not what is frequently understood to be going to heaven or eternal happiness. This is not about the souls going to paradise. It is not a blessing which lies on the other side of death. No, John would say, justifying grace is now. Now, now is the dawning of such a grace. We experience it in in this life, and we experience it fully in in the day we are consummated in glory. That is in the next. Furthermore, justifying grace is chiefly understood to come through the the work of Christ on the cross. Of course, the atoning work, the the shedding of, of Christ's blood. Simply put, we receive and experience justifying grace, that is pardon and forgiveness, new life, when we realize Christ has shed his blood for me. Not just Christ has shed his blood, but Christ has shed his blood for me. We experience justifying grace, and it cannot be anything else without that until it is. But once we realize and accept Christ's death for us, justifying grace is about the fullness of who Jesus is, and not just his death. For Jesus is also our prophet, the spokesperson for God, showing us the way to live. He is indeed our priest who atones for our sins with his own suffering and blood. And he is our king, the Lord of all, the new sovereign and ruler over our hearts and life. For once once when sin reigned, now in its place, Christ does. That, Wesley would say, is the full experience of justifying grace in Christ. For in that fullness of Christ is our prophet and our priest and our king, we might see and pass through the doorway into the rest of the house of grace. Religion itself, Wesley might say, is then sanctifying grace. Grace that not only leads us to conversion, but the grace that leads us from conversion to one experience of grace to the next. It is the grace of living with God. It is the grace of growing, our becoming what God intends us to be. Sanctifying grace is nothing short of the full and complete recovery of the image of God in which we are made. Remember, as I said but a, a couple weeks ago, or uh, last time I was here, yeah, a couple weeks ago, that salvation, Methodists define salvation as the renewal of the image of God. We were made in the image of God. The image was corrupted. But now by the power of the Holy Spirit, through the death, the atoning work of Christ, that image is remade and is continually being reformed into, back into the image of God. And what is that image like? Who is it, who's that image of? Christ himself. 
Indeed, sanctifying grace is the image of Christ imprinted upon our own souls, our hearts being filled with nothing but love of God and love of neighbor. It is the grace that leads us from inner holiness to outward holiness and back again. It is the grace that leads us from personal experience to social justice and from social justice back into personal experience of faith. It is the grace about which religion has been known for its best good works, mercy, charity, and so forth. Are you going on to perfection is a great Methodist question. It is our emphasis upon sanctifying grace that this is the purpose of religion itself. And we have a doctrine of Christian perfection. This is the one of, the, of many traditional questions I was asked at ordination. It has been asked of all Methodist clergy from the very beginning. Are you going on to perfection? Yes. Yes, we thunderously reply, all of us ordinands. It is part of our emphasis as Methodists, as Wesleyans. It is our bread and butter. The idea is that salvation in Christ is not just from something, it's for something. That gets me excited. In fact, more importantly, it is for something. It is the transformation of human lives and through them, the transformation of human society. It is nothing less than the love of God shown broadly within and broadly through those who claim the name of Christ. This is grace. God's gracious activity through Jesus happening today. Happening today through the power of the Spirit in us and through our lives. The gracious presence of God experienced in our own thoughts, words, and actions. It is our growing in this grace, in this love, until we are perfected by it. Not that we are perfect in every aspect of life, of course not. We shall not be, but perfect in that our motivation be nothing but love of God and love of neighbor, something that Wesley believed was absolutely possible in this life. And though he never claimed it himself, he did claim that he knew some who did. If you want to learn more about that, I'm teaching a class called A Follower's Life, and that's coming up in March, the first couple Sundays in March. I hope you sign up for that, and you'll learn more about what I'm talking about today. It's great stuff. A follower's life there in March. Now, in the first sermon of this theme on January 8th, you learned that our doctrines is a reference to John Wesley's notes on the New Testament and what is often referred to as his standard sermons. And originally there were 44. Later he increased the, this number to 53, but then reversed it because of a legality issue, an issue of legality regarding changing the standard. In the early 1800s, both the British and American Methodists nonetheless recognized the 53 standard sermons that John had proposed. And in fact, still to this day, they are called the standard, the 53 standard sermons. They remain as such. Though most people, most scholars and historians would consider all of Wesley's published 151 sermons as informative, if not authoritative, and yet, true Methodists would also recognize that Wesley himself would not wish us to stop thinking or developing our own practical theology for today. And he says as much in the preface to his standard sermons. Things can, in fact, be different and not contrary, of course. We can have differences and distinctions from Wesley to this day, but it doesn't mean we're contrary. A woman is different than a girl, but she is not contrary to her. A bud or a petal is distinct and different from the stem and to each other, but they are not contrary to one another. So we have our doctrines and we think and let think. If you wanna read yourself in Wesley's own words, much of what I've already said today, you can, and you can look it up under standard sermon number 43, part of the original 44, and it's called the scriptural way of salvation. And compared to most of Wesley's sermons, you might be actually able to read that one. And if you haven't read Wesley, if you don't know, if, unless you've read Wesley's sermons, you don't know what I mean by that, but give it a shot sometime and you're like, oh, wow, okay. But the scriptural way of salvation was originally written as an essay, and, and I don't know that it was ever used as an actual sermon, but it, it's, it's more readable. It's, it's quite readable. And uh, it is established as a standard sermon in the collection, that is again, number 40, in 1765. And it summarizes so well, so concisely, all the extensive oral preaching on the subject. John Wesley is recorded as using the Ephesians 2 text over 40 times 
leading up to this date in 1765. And the scriptural way of salvation represents the most comprehensive and concise summary of Wesley's understanding of salvation. I've put before you now some other sermons. You'll see there the scriptural way of salvation and that date, 1765, or excuse me, yeah, it's number 43 in the list, not 40. And uh, below it, you'll see a number of other sermons. Salvation by faith, justification by faith, the circumcision of the heart. These three sermons, portions of those three are in the essay, The Scriptural Way of Salvation. It incorporates portions of each. Salvation by faith, which you notice is standard sermon number one. Hopefully you can read it or read that. And it was first preached in 1738. We'll share more about this momentarily. It also includes portions of standard sermon number five, justification by faith, first preached in 1738 as well, only four days after John Wesley's conversion, if we call it that, but modified and preached at least eight other times until it was finally published as a standard sermon in 1746 in the form we have it today. The circumcision of the heart is is the other sermon he took from from uh, in order to uh, write this essay, The Scriptural Way of Salvation. And uh, it is standard sermon number 17, and it was actually written in 1733, some five years before his conversion. And this is where it gets a little bit complicated and messy. And also, if you give it time, it starts making a whole lot of sense. And finally, the sermon Christian Perfection, while not included in the Scriptural Way of Salvation sermon, is another sermon he preached in 1741, that later became one of the last of the original 44 standard sermons. This one's the number 40, and one of which established the Wesleyan emphasis on sanctification. Let me just kind of walk you through this. Salvation by faith is the first sermon of the standard sermon set, and it's symbolic. It's symbolic as that. It, along with the next three standard sermons, represent essentially the successive four stages of Wesley's eventual alienation from the University of Oxford. He was a fellow there. We would call it, we would say a teaching assistant, called a fellow though at that time. But in the years to follow, he would leave one persona to embrace his new emerging identity as the unlikely leader of a burgeoning revival movement. Having this sermon as the first in the standard demonstrates the importance of his own personal experience that we are saved by faith. Saved by grace through faith and faith alone. On June 11, 1739, almost three weeks after his own personal experience of salvation by faith, this was his chance to preach publicly. He preached in several churches, but this is Oxford. So preaching at Oxford, and he would have had to have known that this would not have been received by sympathetic ears. It would have been too emotional, too personal. In today's parlance, we would say, John has lost control of himself. John was unstately in chapel today. John was improper, out of place. You see, it wasn't the exact words of what he preached, although some of the particular points there would have been problems. It was more so how he went about it. What had happened to Wesley that caused him to change and preach such and eventually be rejected by the university and then subsequently become the leader of this burgeoning movement? It is called Wesley's heartwarming experience, sometimes referred to as his conversion. Wesley described it, especially in those early years of the movement, as the moment he went from an almost Christian to an altogether Christian. It was May 24, 1738. Wesley had just returned from a disastrous missionary journey to America, right here in Georgia, Savannah. You can go, there's a statue of him in Savannah, Georgia. Some of you know this and have seen it. He'd come on the mission to save the souls of the savages. But in his journal, he writes, in actuality, I hope to save my own. On the way, he meets Peter Bollier and the Moravians, the charismatic denomination of Wesley's day. They, unlike him, who was terrified as the storms of open sea raged and and battled against the, the ship, they instead were not afraid. Though the ship at times seemed to be sinking, 
Not even the women nor the children, but all went up on the very top, on the deck itself, and sang praises to God as the storms raged. This impressed Wesley a great deal. So strong was their personal faith in Christ that they were in Christ's hands in this life and for the next. After he arrived in America, he found that the Indians were less than interested in his high church religion, and the pilgrims were disinterested as well. Add to that a bad courtship, or at least a poor ending, to his relationship with Miss Sophie, the governor's daughter. Boy, John could pick them. And after being accused of what we would call defamation of character by re publicly refusing to offer Miss Sophie communion one Sunday, because he had been slighted by her, John would be arrested, or thought he would be, and so he returns to England under the cover of night. Yes, the founder of our faith, leaving Wesley, leaving Georgia under the cover of night, fear of being uh, imprisoned the next day, broken, discouraged, in fact, feeling quite defeated. Upon his arrival back in London, there he once again meets Peter Boyer. And they speak about faith and personal faith, and what that means. And John is invited to attend a Moravian Bible study on Aldersgate Street in London. Wesley's description is in the, of this experience in his journal, May 24, 1738, he writes, at about a quarter before nine uh, at night, nine o'clock at night, about a quarter before nine, while the leader was reading Martin Luther's preface to the book of Romans, and in so describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. <laughs> I felt I did trust in Christ and Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. John had tried his whole life to earn the sense of assurance of God's love and God's forgiveness. He had practiced religion methodically and rigidly, only to fail time and time again. Now, by faith alone, he had received the gift. Justification by faith is standard sermon number five, and it is the sibling, we might say, the sibling of salvation by faith, sermon number one almost a twin, at least in spirit, if not in word. Originally, salvation, or excuse me, originally justification by faith pre was preached just four days after his heartwarming experience. John would preach it again and again. The emphasis was, being about, uh, was upon being forgiven and pardoned by nothing but the grace of God through faith, putting one's whole faith and trust in Christ alone and for salvation, that Christ didn't just die for the sins of the whole world generally and impersonally, but his sacrifice was for each and every one, each of us able to accept for ourselves this marvelous gift. We know of eight other occasions that Wesley preached justification by faith including the last time he preached it before he published it in the form we have it today. And what was it that afforded that last occasion of his preaching? It was in his hometown of Epworth, where he grew up, at the Epworth Church, where his daddy was an Anglican priest nearly his whole life. Here's a painting that describes or, or illustrates this moment. Here, John preaching. See what John is standing upon? See how he is above those gathered? What is it that he is standing upon? It is his father's tomb. Having the doors of the church closed him, the pulpit refused. John went outside and climbed upon his father's grave to tell all who would gather about the justifying grace of God, that they too could experience God's grace through faith in Christ and faith alone. Finally, friends, the circumcision of the heart, which he includes, is standard sermon number 17. And he wrote this one five years before the heartwarming experience. And at first, as the revival movement began and the Methodists started growing, John was reluctant to talk about or include any of his work prior to his heartwarming experience. Now, let me pause here and say this. 1738, May 24, 1738, the heartwarming experience was not magical. It was profound, 
not magical. John writes in his journals all kinds of ups and downs in faith, has all kinds of battles with doubts and disbeliefs about this or that, uncertain moments, wonderful moments. What May 24, 1738 is, is about is not happily ever after. What it's about is a profound experience of God's grace that for John opened up the door, opened up the door to more and more and more experiences of God's grace. And the one thing that did change was that never again after May 24, 1738, never again did John, John write about the fear of death. He never again wrote that he was afraid to die. Now, he was reluctant, though, to include anything he'd written before that time. His emphasis upon living for God and, and, and being about works of mercy and charity were God's intention for life, and he was concerned. And then he realized there's nothing wrong with thinking like that. There's nothing wrong with what he had said or thought previously. Of course God wants us to live for, for mercy and acts of charity. Of course God wants us doing good. Of course. The difference became that he no, lo no longer did things like this for God's approval or to somehow earn salvation. Instead, doing acts of mercy and acts of charity, being about the good work of transforming the world back into the good creation was the natural result of a life of faith and grace. In fact, none of the terms that we talk about as uniquely Wesley or Methodist are in fact unique to Wesley or the Methodists, but it is the way that Wesley uses them and specifically how he combines them that was different. The Methodist understanding of salvation is saturated in grace. God is before it. God is during it. God is after it. God is all through. It combines relatable personal experience with imaginable theological understanding. It combines the Reformation's emphasis upon faith and faith only, as well as religion's greatest gift, doing social good, acts of charity and mercy. The Methodist understanding of salvation sees personal and social holiness as the same gracious act of God. Wesley combines the passion and personal experience of the Moravian sect with the rich theological foundation of the Church of England. For the Methodist, the experience of salvation is both a moment, a decision, and an ongoing process of discovering one form of grace after another, one moment of grace after another. For the Methodist, the purpose of salvation is the renewal of God's image on us and through us to all creation. It is the emphasis that we are saved to something even more so than we are saved from something. Methodists emphasize being saved by grace because it is all God's idea, all God's work, and all God's doing. And we experience it through faith. And when we do, it naturally leads to a life of holiness, of Christ-likeness, because God's presence and activity in Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit is always leading us from one transformative moment to the next. It is amazing grace. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not the result of works. So that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God prepared beforehand so that we may walk in them. Friends, let's stand and sing about such amazing grace.